Tom and Hannah are here to share with us that the use of Cradle, they had, with the use of Cradle, they had an improved R&D experience. Transparency, easier forensics and debugging, and vastly simpler application, application code. I hope we'll learn something from them. So a warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Hannah and Thomas. Tom. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. It's very nice to be back in the Evoli one. That's really been my science education in total. I want to give a brief introduction why we are here at a technical conference, whereas we are really working in the medical field. So Tom and I work at the Massachusetts General Hospital, second oldest hospital in the United States after the Benjamin Franklin uh, in Philadelphia. We recently merged with the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, and are now the Mass General Brigham, uh, not an exciting name per se. Uh, we are uh, Harvard Medical School hospitals, which basically means that uh, we're Harvard Medical School faculty. Uh, this merger made us a very big hospital, uh, 1.5 million patients per year, and we treat about 70% of Massachusetts. It's like if you live in the Netherlands and you only had three hospitals, it's a little bizarre. So um, in the hospital, we do radiotherapy. And for about 60 years, we've been treating with photons and protons, both radiation forms that uh, are uh, applied externally by very articulated machines, seven degrees of freedom, so that we can orient the beam to enter the patient from various directions. These machines have become highly integrated. Uh, they're highly automated, very data-driven. Uh, integrated imaging, and interestingly enough, especially photon machines are going through a s evolution spurt. For example, uh, the Utrecht Medical Center, I don't know the official name, uh, Jan uh, Langedijk, they're developing some very interesting MR-driven machines. So radiation aims to treat the target volume and uh, spare normal tissues. When, proton, when we started with protons, photons were not even close in their capabilities. So, for example, um, uh, this is the treatment of a clifocardoma, a very lethal disease that we actually could cure with protons. And you can see that compared to photons, we have much less dose to surrounding tissues. However, photon technology has dramatically improved, and there's a real competition now between the two. So, why we are here is because radiotherapy has really become data-driven. If you look at the history, there are basically two technology transitions from electromechanical to computer, and that transition was characterized by a major failure mode in the Therac 25 machine, a classic example of not how not to do things. And in the year 2000, another example where data became a uh, data explosion resulted in a fundamental flaw. So we really need now smart data, and that's what we're about. So radiotherapy really is a very data-driven uh, um, discipline. We have two solutions, both developed in, uh, with ICT. One is called ROCP, which manages the workflow between tasks, and Cradle, that manages uh, the execution of a task. Uh, and the key feature that we're using is immutability of data that just automatically, magically uh, generates a lot, meets a lot of requirements of what data should do. So again, ROCP was developed with, uh, it has been a perfect collaboration between MGH and uh, ICT. Uh, ROCP is for radiotherapy, but it's actually a general solution, as is Cradle because the problems that we face in our domain are not unique problems to our domain. So for example, this is one aspect of our domain that we've specifically addressed. This is what is called treatment planning. So we uh, inquire uh, a patient record, infer what needs to be done next, request a particular operation. And this is basically a system that models the patient represented by 3D volume data. We model the beam approach. This is one of them and then compute the dose and iterate this um, um, uh, to achieve what the physician thinks they want. And the core of that system is Cradle, and Tom uh, will go into great detail about that. So this is Cradle. Uh, Tom, again, will explain this loop. Uh, 
It's a very different loop than your normal event loop, and that's, of course, uh, with great benefits, such as the code becomes very clean, very lightweight, very clear separation of responsibility. It's high performance. We do very large uh, calculations of very large data sets, very many different associations that are managed by Cradle. Uh, Cradle can be distributed. It's simple if you want to add uh, uh, complexity. Um, and the data itself uh, uh, assumes very many important features that you want to uh, have. So in summary, because I don't want to kill the time, radiotherapy has a very complex data life cycle. Uh, we very successfully implemented two solutions, this workflow manager and then the system cradle that manages the task itself. It's we applied it to our domain, but it's, again, it's a general solution, and it's been a very nice academic industry relation, and I hope you're interested. And at this point, I want to introduce Tom, who will take over. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so as Hannah said, I'm the software developer who works on Asteroid, that treatment planning system that he was showing. Um, I, yeah, I, I was the original author, the architect of it. Um, and so from my perspective, Asteroid is essentially a, a data flow system um, where we have uh, imported data um, that comes into the system from outside, CT scans, um, user inputs, prescriptions that the physician has come up with. And these are very, uh, some of these are, are very large pieces of data. Um, and then we, we put them through various simulations to see what protons are going to do um, when we shoot them into patients. Um, these simulations output gigabytes of data that go into an optimizer to try to figure out what is the optimal uh, way of treating that patient. Um, and then we send that into an analysis. Um, and then eventually we display those to the user. And there is a uh, iterative cycle here where um, the user is tweaking inputs uh, down here. And then we're rerunning whatever parts are affected and, um, and updating the display. And eventually, you know, hopefully those tweaks are improving the treatment and eventually we find something where the physician is happy and we're going to send that off for, for treatment. And so I want to kind of talk about how we address this, uh, this process. Um, and I want to <laughs> start off by saying that it, that previous diagram was vastly simplified. Even this is a simplification of it. There's a lot of pre-processing steps going on. There are many points where we're pulling off results for display for the user. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it, it's not, a, it's not a, a data flow that you could easily show on a slide. Um, and so the, the real challenge that we had with Asteroid was, you know, when the user does something, how do we know uh, if that affected the results that we're displaying? And if it did, then uh, how do we know, like, which of these uh, nodes need to be updated? And you might just intuitively think that, okay, well, you could, you know, construct this graph of objects and you could keep track of the inputs and you know when you see an input like this change down here you propagate a signal that tells all these uh, downstream calculations that they're now invalid um, they have to rerun um, what the where that uh, tends to break down is um, the fact that uh, even the structure of this graph is actually dynamic and it changes as the user uh, changes how they want to construct their treatment plan. So there might be like other pre-processing pre steps that get added or we might decide that we need to do whole other simulations. So um, trying to sort of like construct a graph like that and maintain it according to 
uh, what the user is, you know, uh, changing uh, is is difficult. Um, so um, there's so we we kind of took um, inspiration from the world of declarative user interfaces because there's a there's a similar problem in that world where you have these um, UI object trees essentially where um, all your widgets are represented by objects. They have a hierarchical representation, um, and you are, you know, they, they have values, labels, whatever. Um, and, you know, to update the user interface on the screen, you just update the objects in that tree. And that is also dynamically structured because you might have to add widgets and remove them as, you know, the application progresses. Um, and then, in the typical application, you also have some state that is not part of that object tree, but is part of the application itself, and that is also changing. And that generally contains some redundancies with what's going on um, inside the object tree. So you have some state that's represented in the object tree, and you have to find some way to, to <laughs> sort of synchronize these things, right? And that's a very hard problem, and it's often uh, sort of a, a source of uh, errors in uh, application code because you, you don't get this synchronization quite right. Um, so there's a solution to this um, it, and uh, with uh, what's called a declarative UI system where the, the um, in, in declarative UIs you basically say, okay, well, the application shouldn't be updating the UI object tree. The application should just worry about updating its application state. That is the authoritative uh, view of the world. And then the application will provide this render function and will put whatever the current application state is into that render function. And the application will output a description of what the UI should look like for that state. And then we'll put that into this declarative UI system. And um, that will worry about how to update the actual UI object tree. So maybe some, maybe there are extra nodes here that aren't here and those need to be removed. Maybe a node here now has a new label, so we'll update that over here. All that logic is contained within the declarative UI system. And that's, all that complexity is in there. And that, um, you know, this is code that is written once by people <laughs> who actually know what they're doing. And, uh, you know, there are existing systems out there, especially in the world of JavaScript, like React and Angular, that operate on the DOM. And they do exactly this. Um, they uh, very efficiently take these descriptions and um, apply them, uh, transform the actual DOM into whatever the app says it should be. Um, and so, we would very much like to have something uh, like this in uh, for, for Asteroid. Um, and oh, by the way, uh, yeah, declarative uh, is th th what it means to be declarative is that your application specifies what it wants to do rather than how it should be done. So uh, the application is just going to specify that it wants this, not, uh, not how it should be updated. So we're looking for a declarative solution ourselves. We're looking for something like this, um, something where we can take uh, our application state, put it through some kind of data flow renderer, um, have that renderer output what we want the data flow to look like for the current state of the application, and then what results we want to pick out of there. Um, so we'll specify whatever the imp current inputs are for, for this application state, what functions they should pass through, and then what outputs we're looking to display. And then we want to put that through some sort of data flow resolution system. And we want that to just give us results, right? And we'll just display those to the user. And anytime the user changes something, we'll just, you know, go back through this, uh, this flow again and get new results. Um, and yeah, again, all, all, uh, we, want all, we want to put all the complexity here, not 
not in the application. So we built that system. <laughs> uh, we call it Cradle. And uh, it's, a, it's a C++ uh, engine um, that integrates into an application or um, into a, like a, 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 onto a command line or a researcher's desktop. And it's, it's, a, it's an engine uh, where you can, you can pass in these descriptions of, or these graphs of calculations that you want to do, where you want to get the result um, this top level result, and it will uh, process that result or process that um, that graph. It will um, check to see if it has results in, in its cache. It will it knows how to invoke the functions um, when it needs to. It will um, invoke them in parallel when it can, and then it will give you a result value. And it also keeps track of what it's doing. So. Later on, when you have a result value, you, you want to know where that came from, it can say, oh, well, here was the calculation graph that generated that result. And um, so I should back up a sec. Um, the, so we, the real challenge here, of course, is to make this efficient. Um, we want to be able to, at, at real time speeds, uh, Gener generate calculation graphs for our applications, send them through this resolution system, and have it tell us at, in, at real time speeds whether or not that result that we currently have on the screen is still correct or issue calculations. And so the real, the real challenge is um, keeping these descriptions small so that um, they can be processed quickly enough. And as I said, we have megabytes or gigabytes of data that are going into to some of these calculations. And so obviously doing some kind of diff or hash or whatever on these gigabytes of data is uh, not something that we can do at real time. Um, so the, the way that we approach that is through immutable data. And immutable data is a fairly simple concept. Um, we're just, it just means that you know, once you assign an ID to a piece of data, that ID is forever associated with that data and no other data. And this, this simplifies your world a lot because there are no updates to data, so you never have to worry about um, whether or not an update is atomic or whether or not its uh, updates are being ordered correctly or if they conflict with one another. Um, it also has a lot of benefits that I'm not gonna go into here in terms of like creating persistent data structures where you can store every, you can efficiently store the whole history of your application data. But um, what we care about most here is that because this ID is forever associated with that data, we can replace you know, instances of that data with, it, with just its ID, and we're sure that that ID uh, will always refer to that data. So it's essentially the same. And so that gives us um, the ability to make these calculation descriptions small. Um, so here, wherever we have a, a large value, we can just replace it with its ID. And then we can uh, obviously assign IDs to functions and, and we can uh, get very compact um, definitions of, of our, the calculations that we want to do. Um, so here's a, an actual example of a um, a node in a calculation tree. Um, this is a function that um, runs one of those simulations that I was talking about, and it, you know, all of these arguments that it's taking in are, are megabytes or at least kilobytes of data, and um, it's outputting gigabytes of data, and it takes several minutes to run. But, um, you know, we can fully represent the calculation with just these few hundred bytes here. And we can even go a step further and just store this in our immutable data store and say, oh, well, this calculation actually just has the, this ID up here. And now we can refer to it using that ID. Um, so I'm going to take a brief walk through what it actually looks like to generate one of these calculation graphs in code and um, send it off, uh, or at least generate it. <laughs> um, 
So we're going to look at, uh, so this is, this is Asteroid, and we're going to look at um, uh, the, uh, the calculation grid here. So these lines are the calculation grid, and you can see that there are varying levels of detail. Um, so these, are, these outlines denote uh, structures that we care about, um, especially in the center here is where the tumor is. So we care a lot about this area. This is where all the dose is going. And a as you get out further out to other parts of the patient, we don't really care as much about what's going on here. We don't need to calculate it with the same resolution. So we have this, um, this dynamic uh, adaptive resolution grid. And the user sets this up, obviously, to, to get, the get high, uh, high resolution where they want it. They use this interface where they specify a base resolution that's going to be everywhere, and then higher resolutions inside um, uh, structures or these areas where they, where they need it. And um, this is uh, our data structure for, for storing that. Um, so this stores the overall grid specification. Um, it's got the base spacing like we saw, and it's got a, a list of regions where um, they uh, can override with higher resolution. And this is how we represent a region. It's got a reference to one of those structures, those outlines, and it's got a, a resolution, which is just how many steps up from the base resolution. And this is actual data from a treatment plan um, that uh, just rendered in YAML. Um, and now this is uh, the actual full function for generating the calculation graph that's going to go into um, computing that, that grid. Um, the actual computation is not totally trivial because there's all these 3D meshes and you're doing a bunch of intersections between grid points in the, the meshes. So it's worth sort of creating this description of what you want to do. And um, so, yeah, just to give you a sense of what the overall um, size is, you know, it's not a lot of code. We're going to look at uh, certain areas up close. Um, so. This is the declaration of it. It's, it's actually a pure function. So it, it does take in this cache that it uses to um, you know, memoize results. But it's, um, it can be used it's, for all intents and purposes. It's a pure function. It has an input, which is that calculation grid specification that I showed you. And it has an output, which is a request, a calculation graph. Uh, um, and we call these. Um, we call the, our naming convention is to call these compose uh, dose grid requests. So, because this is all done through composition, so we have requests that um, build up the lower level results that we're interested in, and then we, we we have functions that call those other functions to to construct higher level uh, results that we're interested in, and it's all very nicely functional. There's not a lot of uh, you, you, interplay between things. We don't have to worry about those kinds of details. Um, so here it is calling another uh, composer function to create the, to, to get the request for the geometry of the, um, uh, the, the patient structure, because we need to know the overall bounds of the patient so that we can make sure the grid fits the patient. And it's just going to use that result um, to build up the the, the calculation request that it's doing. Um, you can also see that it is, um, it's, it's got for loops in it, it's got if statements. So it's, it's dynamically deciding based on the application data what should go into this calculation tree. And it's all just normal C++ code. <laughs> it's not, um, and it's also, it's free of concerns with like, oh, where else is this result used? Where, what, like scheduling, whatever. Um, and so this is, this is the, uh, the architecture of Asteroid. Those composer functions that I was just showing live in this little app logic bubble here. Um, and that, that little data definition that I was showing lives in uh, the application state here. And so we have this 
this kind of flow uh, through the app logic layer where um, you, the app state flows into those composer functions. The composer functions generate the uh, calculation graphs that um, denote the results that we need for our application. Those get fed into Cradle, and then Cradle will resolve those to results, and then those results get fed into um, the, the UI. And, and of course, down here, we have the algorithm layer where um, Cradle, uh, so Cradle knows how to talk to the algorithms to, to invoke them when it needs to. But these algorithms are, um, are essentially independent of Cradle. They don't really uh, n need to care that Cradle is calling them, um, other, other than you know, they might need to be able to like, stream their inputs and outputs to like, the cache. They're not, um, they don't have to inherit from, from anything. They're, you can basically create your, you can sort of build your uh, application sort of like from this, from the ground up here, so like f focus on algorithms first, like these are the types of algorithms that we need to, to do this work. And then focus on the app logic layer, so this is how we want to put those algorithms together to create this application. And then, um, and then the UI layer basically just, just sort of guides um, the user through filling out this, this application state. and showing them the results that they get. So there's this loop here where when you edit something in the UI that translates into a new application state that pro go goes through this flow and um, you, know, you see the results. And all of this happens in real time. And um, we can take a look further under the hood. And so our UI is actually also written in a with a declarative UI system. So we have a similar kind of uh, design up here where the UI logic is also declarative. It outputs, it kind of looks at the UI state and the app state, and it creates this UI view. The, the view will reference the results. It'll reference that those, those big inputs that we carried in. And that'll all get put into this declarative UI system, which will take care of actually updating the UI. Um, so there's this nice uh, parallel uh, between the app logic and the UI logic. And both of these are, are written in a declarative way. And um, so beyond what I think is the and <laughs> the primary benefit of, of Cradle, which is that it allows you to, to write those par parts of your application in, in a declarative way, um, it, we, we find that it, it brings a lot of like, side benefits. Um, we've been using Cradle for, I guess, several years now um, in our department. And um, one of the really nice things is that everything becomes transparent and traceable, right? So if somebody sends me a calculation result and they think that something might be wrong with it, then I don't just have a piece of data to look at. I have a whole calculation graph to look at, right? So I can see, well, um, maybe this input here wasn't, wasn't quite right, or maybe they're using the wrong version of this function, or you know, maybe this, like, what, what does this input look like down here? So, uh, this is immensely useful, um, and this is a this is just a screenshot of a um, of a tool that we use for visualizing those calculations. Um, this is another screenshot of a command line tool for searching through calculations. So if you if you're looking for calls to this function that we were looking at before, this will look through this calculation. For, for those and, and output them. Um, it's also immensely useful in testing and validation. So normally we would just test to see um, if we are getting the correct results out of our application, right? but it's also useful to look at whether or not we're requesting the right results. And in, in some cases you actually you really only care <laughs> if you're requesting the correct results. If your 
if you're the developer who's responsible for that app logic layer, then if, if, this is, if, you're, if you're outputting the right request, but somehow getting the, right result, or getting the wrong result, then it's actually it's a problem inside this function, and it's not, it's not your problem, right? So that's, it's kind of nice to have the separation of concerns, and it's also nice to be able to sort of doubly verify that you're doing the right thing. Um, it's also it's great for debugging. Uh, so um, first off, everything is reproducible, right, because we're dealing with pure functions. And if a calculation result goes wrong, we have all the inputs that went into it. Um, so. Uh, for example, if, say, say this node just crashed and um, we never even got to run the top-level node, we'll, we'll get a result. Like the, the app, obviously, the UI will come up with a problem and we'll be able to look at uh, what, what actually happened with this calculation. We'll get to see that this node failed and we'll get to um, see what its inputs were. We'll get to pull it up in a debugger and see why it failed and hopefully we'll figure it out. Um, similarly, if you have a bad result, like I was saying before, if this just, you know, maybe this output actually came through, but it looks suspicious, well, again, we can pull up the full calculation tree and look at why, why it might have gone wrong. Um, it's also, it, it creates a sort of an openness to the application that we often take advantage of. Um, one way you can do that is to, uh, just start manipulating this application state directly. This is not a lot of data, as I was showing you before, that that specification of the calc tree was, you know, like <laughs> maybe tens of, you know, a few lines of, of, of YAML. And um, so this is definitely something that you can edit by hand. Um, you can look at it by hand to see what's going on in, in the application. It is uh, something you can generate from Python code if you want. And so you can do a lot of interesting stuff uh, in automating your, your software by just, by just tapping into this point right here. Um, it's also useful often to look at what calculation graphs are flowing through the system. Um, and Cradle is also open to, you know, exterior access. You can, you can uh, talk to it through Python or the command line. And so it's often useful to, you know, pull out a calculation request, maybe update it, take a look at what it's doing. Um, you can even, you know, add your own algorithms, put a, put a custom algorithm in here, and you can plug those into Cradle. You can even, um, if your application is designed right, you can, you know, get custom results back into the application, and look, look at them in, inside the application. Um, the, having these results here also, it, these tend to be kind of like a nice um, point of exposure for like if you're developing an API for your application and you want to be able to output certain results that are, are in, uh, that you're normally just looking at in the UI, but you want to have external access to them, Cradle can sort of just provide that directly. So we've benefited a lot through that. We have a lot of in-house projects that have, um, leveraged these different points of access to do custom analyses or, or custom workflows into the application. And so, um, yeah, that brings me to uh, what we're working on now, um, which is a, an open source version of Cradle that can talk to a lot of other different sys widely used technologies. So. We think this core idea of calculation, resolution, and, and caching, and bookkeeping is applicable outside the world of medicine. And right now, Cradle is pretty, <laughs> just for technical reasons, kind of uh, you know, only really useful within our ecosystem. So what we're working on is uh, an, an open source version. It's got an MIT license. Um, it's all in modern C++. And basically what we would like to do is, you know, uh, generalize all these various aspects of Cradle and bring these core mechanics to work with other technologies. So we want to be able to, like, 
generalize your function sources so that they could come from GitHub or Docker or um, you know, uh, just maybe some custom code that you write in your C++ application. Um, we want to generalize the data sources uh, so you can pull them from the cloud or from wherever you have them. Um, we want to generalize how your functions are executed so you can run them on your cluster if you need to or you can run them in the cloud. We want to generalize how the caching is done so you can use a cloud storage or a cloud caching uh, mechanism. And we want to expand on the, the number of uh, client interfaces that we provide to this whole system so that you can access them more easily, say, through JavaScript. And um, yeah, so, so we're, we're working on this right now. Um, like I said, we think it's useful um, outside of our field if you're doing, you know, calculations that take a long time to run, that use large data, and you have this sort of iterative workflow, whether it's within an application or just, you know, on your own desktop through your R&D process. Um, we think Cradle um, provides a good solution for you to sort of more, uh, more efficiently go through that uh, iter iteration process without, um, without worrying about <laughs> which results are valid and without, um, uh, without making mistakes, <laughs> thinking that a result is still valid when it's not. Um, and so the, the one, I guess, uh, requirement really for using Cradle is that it requires pure functions. And um, a, just from a uh, theoretical standpoint, a, a pure function is just one that s gives consistent results when it's presented with the same inputs. And um, it doesn't produce observable side effects. I guess you could, you could be logging or something and we don't care, but um, we don't want you, you know, like we don't want the function to produce side effects that you're really depending on. Um, so an, a, a trivial example of a pure function is, is addition. Um, a trivial example of an impure function is this accumulate um, because it's got this internal sum and it keeps uh, whatever input it takes, it just keeps adding that to the sum and returning the sum. So obviously if you were to keep calling this with say one, it's not going to return the same result every time so we can't cache that result. Um, but we're also not religious about <laughs> being pure. So this is not a system where you have to write all your code in Haskell or ML or whatever. Um, your interfaces have to be pure. So you have to, your functions essentially have to be black boxes that take inputs and produce outputs and produce the same outputs for the same inputs. But they don't have to be written in a functional style. All our code is C++. Uh, this is another example here of a, a pure function that, um, you know, it tries to mimic the Python range function, so it returns a, a list of, of numbers from zero up to n. It's all, it's doing that all in an imperative style. Um, none of this code looks functional, but it has a purely functional interface, right? So you could plug this into Cradle. Um, and uh, it's also worth pointing out that many, um, many Unix commands are pure. So like grep, for example, you give it a file, a string to search for, it returns you the occurrences of that string in the file, that's a pure function. Um, so there's obviously a lot of existing programs out there that um, you know, take in an input file and some arguments, produce an output file, we consider those your functions, those you could hook up to Cradle. And um, you know, you could put one of those in a Docker image and we consider that a pure function. Um, so yeah, in summary, um, we, uh, Cradle provides intelligent high performance calculation resolution. Um, it enables a more declarative approach to scientific computing. Uh, we think it's bookkeeping, offers a number of side benefits, like debugging, traceability, openness, and um, it's open source, and we're working to generalize it to support other technologies and use cases. And um, if you're interested in this, you should come talk to us. 
We're working with ICT to do this right now. So um, you can come see us at the ICT booth. And I think now we'll um, open it to questions. I think so. Uh, Tom, thank you very much. <laughs> Sure, there must be questions for Tom, <laughs> since he mentioned that it's going to be open source now. Um, any questions at the timing? Yeah. Let me come to you. Sorry. Yeah. Please state your name and your question, and Tom will repeat the question for the video. Yeah, so my name is Arya Moore from TNO. Um, I see it actually questions related to the open sourcing. So, what are your ideas about really creating community around the open source? That you um, okay, so the, the, the question was about creating community around the open source. Um, I, um, I'm sort of hoping that, we'll, that this will uh, start that, <laughs> that development. Um, and I think the, the partnership with ICT has already helped bring more people on, onto the development of it. And I... <laughs> I, I am not uh, an expert on building community, <laughs> so I'm open to ideas <laughs> about how that might uh, best be done. Um, but my, my goal here is just to get the idea out and see who is interested in it. And I think ICT is already starting to like, turn the wheels on, on building that community. Community really starts at the ICT booth, I understand. Yeah. 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 Any more questions at the moment? Please state your name and tell me you'll repeat the question for me. Mm -hmm. yeah, my name is Jean Rolstein. Um, uh, something in the beginning of your presentation triggered me, uh, and that's more about uh, safety uh, issues. Um, you mentioned there that uh, if the user does something uh, that, that uh, well, this cradle starts doing stuff, uh, so how do you know it is the user that did it? Uh, okay, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah. yeah. Because, because the, the, the thing is, it's, it's about radio therapy, so I would like to be sure that, that if you are getting an input, that this input is... Uh, yeah, okay, so the question is um, how Cradle is sure that the user um, did triggered the, the input change that it is responding to. I guess that's a... Um, yeah, that, that's a security question because you heard that Cradle has this API, and you're and so you're wondering who else is who else might be talking to that API. That's that's a good question. Um, so the clinical deployment um, has uh, ha has a, a local desktop component and a, a cloud component. The cloud component is all secure. Um, it re relies on everything, all the requests are authenticated. The desktop component is um, sort of built into the, the desktop application, so it's only communicating in process. So we kind of just as assume that that's secure, <laughs> I guess. Um, but I guess an, a larger answer to your question is that um, from Cradle's standpoint, all you're really doing is creating a calculation result. You're not injecting that calculation result anywhere. So Cradle just, is just saying, hey, the result of, that, of, of applying that function to those inputs is this piece of data. Um, someone could hack into your system and request a custom calculation, and that wouldn't necessarily disrupt your workflow unless they somehow injected it into your workflow. And, and that is a whole other security system, right? Like, um, Cradle is just sort of creating data, um, so. Yeah. Uh, I understand. So Cradle, that's that's it's it's uh, the thing I uh, like about Cradle is also this this uh, the tria that, that uh, sort of helps with uh, kind of event recording. Of course, auto analysis can be done very well. Uh, mm -hmm. Finding out if algorithms are correct or not. Uh, so. Uh, I think the trigger was with exploit, the, the whole thing, and that's, that's before that, and that's, that's, uh, and that's not, 
I'm not talking about security only, but mostly about safety. So uh, it was okay. about, uh, well, killing people with the things and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess the, the follow-up is about whether or not it's safe and like is the, are the results safely going back into the application. I feel that it is a lot safer because it, it's much simpler and all of that complex logic about deciding when to update results is in this one system that is specialized in doing that. And so the application code is uh, sort of freed of that burden. It's also it provides a lot of traceability, so we can say for sure that a particular result did come from those functions and those inputs. So overall, we feel that it has actually dramatically increased safety. Thanks very much for that question. We'll take it to the community.